One of the biggest football and rivalries is that between Newcastle United and Sunderland Football Club. That is between the Geordies and the Mackhams, the white and black stripes and the red and white stripes. That is the Tyne and Weir Derby, the Derby of the North East of England. As the name suggests, the two teams hail from Newcastle upon Tyne and Sunderland. They are just around 12 miles apart. That's 19 kilometers for any other listeners outside the UK, which makes it one of the closest as derbies to not actually be two teams from the same city, the name Tyne and Weir being the two rivers that run through both cities respectively. Given the close proximity of the two cities, most people outside of the Northeast can't tell the two sides apart when they're not wearing their distinctive red and white or black and white uniforms. However, for most people within the Northeast, this distinction is very clear cut and obvious as soon as someone opens their mouth. The rivalry between Newcastle and Sunderland in football goes back to 1883, when the two sides first met, albeit this time as Newcastle East End against Sunderland. Sunderland had the upper hand and won 2-0 in that match. In 1901, they would play one another again, this time at St James's Park, with 120,000 people cramming into a stadium that only had real capacity for around 30,000 showing just how much interest there was in this regional derby. While there were a few mixed results in this era, in the period from 1904 to 1905, Sunderland had their most back-to-back wins in the Tyne and Weir derby, winning with three goals against Newcastle's one and two for these years running. And in 1908, they would get their biggest win over their Geordie rivals in an absolute thrashing of 9-1 at St. James's Park. However, the Magpies and their fans could be consoled by the fact that that year they actually went on to become first in the league and win the trophy, with Sunderland coming in at third place. In 1920, it would be the Geordies' turn to get their biggest win over their Mackham rivals, winning 6-1, a feat that they achieved again in 1955. Given the recent scorelines when Newcastle played against Spurs, I think definitely that record could be shattered if Sunderland found themselves back in the Premier League anytime soon. The intense rivalry between Newcastle and Sunderland has at times led to hooliganism and violence, one of the worst incidents sometimes being attributed to March 2000 or March 2002 was when members of the Seaburn Casuals, a Sunderland football firm or an ultra firm as it might be called in the rest of Europe, went to North Shields and there fought against members of the Newcastle Gremlins firm, with one person being given uh, lifelong brain damage as a result of the violence and many arrests being made by the police. Reporters at the time referred to the scenes as something out of Braveheart. To be a rate of gas, that was all I fucking knew. Knocking on the doors, collecting people's crap. Saving up me money for me first on the top. On the pitch, the period from 2002 to 2006 would be a golden one for the Geordies, with their top scorer, Alan Shearer, helping them in five consecutive victories against Sunderland, the largest in the Tyne and Weir victories back to back. However, in the 2016-17 season, Sunderland would be relegated from the Premier League, followed by another relegation into the third division of English football. And since then, neither Newcastle nor Sunderland have been in the same league, and so there have been no professional football matches between the two sides, and the Tyne and Weir derby is currently as it stands. So having gone through the footballing rivalry and results of the two teams, what's the historical reason for the Tyne and Weir rivalry that we see playing out on the pitch? Well, ultimately, this is a battle not just between the football teams of the two various cities, but between the two cities themselves and how they are perceived. The history of Newcastle has always been linked to coal and may in fact be the reason for the Northumbrian tartan being white and black and therefore making it onto the shirts of the football team as well. We know that by 1250, coal was being exported from the port of Newcastle upon Tyne, and a century later, this was recognised by the king at the time, who gave the burgesses of Newcastle a powerful economic class, the official royal stamp that they were the only ones who could sell coal from the River Tyne. 
They also tried to get monopolies on other goods along the Tyne as well. So coal was incredibly important. It was mined out in the Tyne Valley and in the large northern coal shelf in Northumberland as well. And then it was brought down by barges or keels, as they're often called locally, down to Newcastle and there exported out to other places in England and indeed in Europe. Now, Sunderland as well did also have a history linked with coal, but in its slightly earlier in its medieval history, it was a more important centre of salt production. This being done when large vats of salt water were taken from the sea and then boiled at high temperatures to leave only the salt behind. However, increasingly what they were using from the 16th century when this salt production rapidly expanded in Sunderland is they were using coal to burn as the fuel source for the salt. And so slowly mining communities mining coal sprang up in the Sunderland area as well as in the Newcastle area. And so coal slowly became more and more important for Sunderland as well. Although of course being so close to Newcastle, a centre that was royally recognised as the uh, one of the most important coal exporting cities in England, this led to fierce competition between the two cities already in the Middle Ages and into the Elizabethan period. This would come to a head in the early modern period. Now in 1640, Newcastle was actually invaded by a Covenanter Scots army of strict Protestants from Scotland who disagreed with Charles I imposing bishops upon the Kirk in Scotland. And so they invaded the northeast of England and took over Newcastle. Now to avoid Newcastle falling into enemy hands again, in 1642, the King Charles I stationed a royalist garrison in the city itself. This was especially important because in August of 1642, England would split into two factions, those loyal to Parliament and its army, and those loyal to the King and his army. This is of course obviously called the English Civil War, sometimes the War of the Three Kingdoms. And Newcastle would, because of its royalist garrison and its privileges from the King for exporting coal, they would support the King. This put them on the royalist side of the divide. However, Sunderland and in fact most of the rest of the north sided with Parliament and had parliamentarian forces occupying it during the Civil War. So now we have for the first time that Newcastle and Sunderland were literally on two opposing sides in a war. So perhaps this is the first Tyne and Weir derby that we see. During this period, the Parliamentarian Navy actually blockaded the River Tyne to stop the coal exports, financially aiding the King who had more support in the south of the country. However, Parliament were also in need of getting coal themselves for the areas that they controlled and their own production. And so they turned to the inhabitants of Sunderland who were also of course exporting coal and they greatly aided Sunderland in producing more coal and sending that to the areas of the country that they controlled. So at the same time as a physical war, there is also an economic war going on between the cities of Newcastle and Sunderland for who got to export the coal during this period. Period. Now in 1643 there would actually be a battle between the two sides in the northeast. This is the Battle of Bolden Hill and it pit a Scots covenanting army who had sided with Parliament uh, and troops from Sunderland against troops from the city of Newcastle which had its royalist garrison and local militias drawn up from the local area and from County Durham. This battle would be fairly inconclusive. So let's say it's a 1-1 draw, neither side really claiming a, a great victory. However, in the end, Newcastle would come under siege, it would be isolated, and with a much larger army, it would have to capitulate and would remain in parliamentarian hands for the rest of the war. Now, obviously, Charles and the Royalists would go on to successively lose each of the English civil wars, as they're called. And Charles was himself actually held captive in Newcastle for quite a while. It's in the Lloyd's Building on Grey Street. He was kept there captive by the Scots and later by Parliament itself. And it seems that this is one of the big inciting incidences of competition between Newcastle and Sunderland in terms of the coal exports and in terms of siding with different factions during the Civil War. Another incident that's often cited but there is ultimately a lot less evidence for is that this goes back to 1715, a period when there were Jacobite risings uh, for the claimants of the throne from the Stuart family who had been deposed by William of Orange 
back in 1688 and tried to regain the throne for uh, many years during the, the late 17th century and early 18th century. The story goes that these two cities once again found themselves on opposing sides, but in fact it is a little more complicated here. In 1715, uh, there was an army that came down from Scotland. Many of the Highlanders and other clans supported the Stuart cause and marched down into England, or that was their goal. When they came to Newcastle, however, Newcastle refused to give over the keys of the city. And this is one of the proposed etymologies for the word Geordie itself, that this comes from Geordie being a, a sort of 18th century shortened version of the name George, or a supporter of George would be a Geordie. And this is, of course, relating to the name of the king at the time, the king down in London, George I of the House of Hanover who came to the throne after William of Orange and his wife had both died. And so those in Newcastle, because they supported George, became known as Geordies, although that is only one of the possible explanations for that term. So that would mean that Newcastle is once again siding with the king. So far makes sense. That seems to be pretty uh, following the pattern. However, there's a lot less evidence that Sunderland was particularly pro-Jacobite during this period. Unlike some places in Lancashire and Northumberland where they actually raised men and there were earls that openly came out and supported the Stuart kings, we don't really get that as much in Sunderland. There is a story that one of these lords, when uh, seeking refuge, did manage to find refuge among some of the Sunderland keelmen, so the, the barges that were transporting coal that they may have hidden him among there. But other than that, I wasn't able to find a, a huge amount of Jacobite sympathy, and they certainly weren't openly fighting against those in Newcastle for the, the Stuart pretender to the throne. So that one maybe is a little bit overblown, but it's certainly true that for the rest of the 18th century and into the, the 19th century and the 20th century, it was the rivalry between Newcastle and Sunderland, both of which were important cities on northern rivers that were exporting coal and crucially also building ships, something that really comes in in the 19th century in both Newcastle and in Sunderland. And it's possible that this is where the term Macam comes from. Macam in the local dialects would mean make them, Macam. And it's possible this came from a, a longer phrase, which was Macam and Tagam, which would mean make them and take them. And there's been quite a lot of discussion about where this comes from. Quite possibly it started off as a derogatory term for those in Sunderland, probably then having its origin, ironically enough, in Newcastle. One interesting reference to how these two cities and their various mariners wanted to differentiate themselves when at sea is from William Fordus, who was writing in 1857 in his History of Durham. And he writes, a writer in a recent periodical supplies us with the curious information that mariners term a vessel from the Tyne a Geordie, and from the Weir a Jamie. At sea, they can distinguish the one from the other by the different colours on their bows, sides, stems, etc. Now, I would, of course, love to know whether these colours were already the white and the black and the red and the white. Uh, that would, of course, be some very nice continuation. But considering the first Newcastle uh, kit and the first Sunderland kit were, were neither the white and, and red or the white and black stripes, it seems quite unlikely. Where the term Jamie comes from is not entirely clear either. It would suggest some connection with James. So perhaps if they were more ardent Jacobite supporters, but this is already over a century on from the Jacobite rising. So that seems a little unlikely. In any case, the term Jamie seems to have disappeared from use, whereas the term Geordie is, is very common in use once again. But this seems to have been one of the key themes in keeping the rivalry going, especially on the Newcastle side, um, a sort of folk etymology for where the word Macam comes from is that Macam and Tacam is basically saying that in Newcastle they make the ships and in Sunderland they take the ships. Um, or that it refers to jobs. So a lot of people from Sunderland went to the, the larger Newcastle docks uh, and took work there. Uh, and this obviously wasn't, this didn't find a lot of favour with people in Newcastle, the dock workers, the local dock workers, who felt that their own jobs were being threatened from people from Wearside. And that ultimately, probably in the early 20th century, has, has played in um, a lot into the rivalry between the two cities, and ultimately that has manifested on, on the football pitch. Of course, in 1892, Newcastle did have more than one 
professional football team. They had Newcastle East End and Newcastle West End. But when they joined together to make Newcastle United, it meant that there was only really one big club in Newcastle. The question then could be, well, why wasn't there a rivalry between Newcastle, which is on the, the north side of the River Tyne, and Gateshead, which is on the south side of the Tyne? That's a good question. I mean, the Gateshead team generally doesn't play uh, as, as high a, a level of football as Newcastle does. And so perhaps that's why the obvious rivalry was instead between Newcastle and Sunderland, which did have a, a better football team. So they found themselves in the same leagues that were being organised at the time. Um, and that's where that, that rivalry has come in from the, the um, historical examples as well between the two cities. It should also be noted that there is another northeast derby, in fact, technically two other northeast derbies, and that is with Middlesbrough, which also isn't very far away from both of those cities. And then you get the uh, Tyne and Tees derby, the Tees being the river that flows through Middlesbrough, uh, and the, 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 the Weir and Tees derby as well between Sunderland and Middlesbrough, which is possible because they now play in the same division. So let me know in the comments below. Are you a Geordie? Are you a Magpie, a Newcastle fan? Are you a Magum? Are you a, a Jamie, as it might once have been called, and a Sunderland fan? Let me know in the comments below. And if you're a fan of neither, then uh, do you support another team? Have you heard of the Tyne and Weir derby before? And do you think that it deserves the reputation as being one of the biggest rivalries in footballing history? I think having grown up in the northeast of England and having lived um, in Gateshead, so right across the river from Newcastle, I think in the in the region it's a very important distinction. Um, but I'm not sure how it's seen in the rest of England or the rest of the world when probably people are thinking more of things like the uh, you know the Derby, Liverpool and Everton and the kind of North London derbies and Man U and Man City and things like that. Let me know if you'd like to see any other videos about some of the. Um, various football and rivalries that exist uh, and if so which ones you would like to see perhaps something like the old firm is very interesting the Klassiker in the Netherlands El Clasico uh, the Madrid derby there's often a lot of interesting history and social history religious divides many reasons why there are there are footballing rivalries um, outside of just being in the same place in the same city but anyway thank you very much for watching I have been Hilbert and this has been the history Dan Cunny.